I wanted to look at some of the other um, some of the other simulations and uh, just talk about that. Um, I think the biggest one that's really been a long time coming is a four-year analysis. I, I think I should uh, finally get to that um, so that, you know, <laughs> I'm not just talking about four-year analysis forever without ever doing it. Uh, so I'm going to just run this on, uh, download it and run this on my computer so that hopefully it uses less CPU power than it, it would if it's running in a browser simulation. Um, so what this simulation does is it um, kind of makes it simpler uh, some of the calculations that you might have to do. Um, so there might be some uh, point to describing some of the theory in Fourier analysis. Um, so let me write out the um, expressions that um, underlies the, the, the demonstration you are going to see with the simulation. So I think uh, the good starting place is to imagine um, kind of a waveform. So imagine a wave as a function of time. Um, here, the y-axis doesn't matter. It's whatever the wave is. If it's a, a, like a signal on your oscilloscope, it might be voltage. And, um, and we can make it a little bit easy for ourselves and say that this is a, a repeating wave. So I'm just gonna think of um, where, I, so I'm gonna only draw and represent uh, one period. Um, so this is one period of the wave or one and a half period. And what the wave might look like is, um, so the kind of easiest, the simplest would be, oh, you could have a sinusoidal wave in the case representing this wave is um, easy, you know. Uh, my function as a function of time is just uh, some amplitude times the sine of uh, omega t, or in terms of this parameter here, it's just gonna be two pi times t over the period t. Uh, that's simple enough. And you can imagine doing similar descriptions even for any arbitrary waves. Um, imagine you have something like a sawtooth wave function. Wait, that's not, let me do triangular wave so that my t is actual one period. So you can imagine doing uh, something like a triangular wave. And um, if you are trying to, sorry, I can throw my triangles. Um, if you're trying to, write down analytical expression for this a triangular wave. It, um, yeah, let me use letter G. It's, uh, you know, potentially not quite so nice. I mean, you can definitely write it out. You can write it out using a piecewise function. You can say, all right, my function is gonna be, uh, uh, let me just let the slope be one. So my function is gonna be T from zero to uh, zero to uh, my t equals uh, t over four. And then it's gonna be this uh, downward slope. So minus t plus, uh, um, plus I guess t over four. So that this point matches up uh, from t equals uh, t over four to, um, to this point here, which will be three t over four. And then it's gonna be again t from, um, this time I have to make sure it's starting from minus one. So, uh, <laughs> or let me just plug in three t over four here, then it's gonna be uh, minus t over two, I think. Did I do this right? I might have made some mistake, uh, three T over four. So th this is what I mean, uh, headache inducing. So, but you know, you can work through it, you know, with enough time, you can kind of check your expressions carefully to make sure that they match up here, match up here. And um, if you have an arbitrary function like this triangular wave, 
you can imagine describing it in the way I did it here. Now, the Fourier decomposition is the idea that even complicated function like this, it can be approximated by an infinite series of functions of this form. So there are coefficients uh, for the, the this sinusoidal term such that that I can represent this ugly looking function in this form. It can be represented by an infinite sum and it goes uh, from, I guess it goes from one to infinity of, of uh, sine, you, you would need both the sine and cosine to cover all the bases. I think in this case, the sine alone actually does the job, but if you have other kinds of functions, sometimes you might need the cosines. So the, my coefficients would be a n times sine of, and then this two pi t over t, th that part remains the same. What changes is now, um, so this is my fundamental frequency. Um, and for that for n equals one, for n equals values higher than one, that would be my higher harmonics. So n times uh, two pi t over t plus, um, so this is my, um, function that's odd over the period. There's also a function that's even over the period, the cosine. So B sub N times cosine of N to pi T over T. So that the idea that any kind of complicated arbitrary function that's a periodic can be represented by this series expansion in terms of sine and cosine functions that's a Fourier analysis. And, and that's what this simulation lets you explore. So let's uh, explore some of these uh, the Fourier expansions. Um, I think it's gonna be a lot easier if we start out with some of the presets. So let me start out with a preset. I think it is a, yeah, it is a preset for triangle uh, wave. So this is a preset for triangle wave. And I don't know if you can see the colors well here. Um, so you can kind of see it here. Um, let's see. Um, so, um, um, so you can see with this red graph, which is just one single sinusoidal function that you can, as you can see in this sketch as well, it already kind of matches the uh, triangular wave okay. And what these higher harmonics are doing is they are adding a little bit of definition. They are making where this is um, maximum sharper and sharper with each additional um, harmonics. So you might see some pattern here somehow all the even harmonics are zero. I guess they just work out that way. And these all the harmonics, they kind of start out with a relatively small value and they get, get smaller and smaller. And you can see how as you these harmonic values get um, lower and lower, this uh, becomes um, less and less a good fit for a triangular wave until where there is no harmonic at all or yeah, and it's a sinusoidal wave. Um, so I think a triangular wave is one where it's easiest to see how to go from um, how to go from sinusoidal wave to that arbitrary function. It's easiest to see that, and it's also because it's easiest to see that it's also harder to see um, how much broadly applicable it is. So let me show you with a different preset function here. Yeah, square wave is a good one because um, that's, you can actually see it here, even with the presets that uh, with the triangular wave, because this fundamental was already fitting the triangular shape so well, that these higher harmonics, they didn't have the corrections, didn't have to be that big. And so, you know, with a square wave, this uh, uh, fundamental uh, sinusoidal wave, it's a terrible fit for this, uh, what ought to be a square wave. That's why these higher harmonics are more substantial 
it needs greater correction to flatten out this maximum and to add a definition to this transition. And how steep this slope can be is eventually really limited by the highest uh, number of harmonic you get to. You can see that as I reduce the value of harmonics, this uh, steep thing, it gets uh, smaller and smaller. And, and this is uh, something you can, if you want, uh, you, you know, if you have like an hour to spend doing calculus, you can work this out uh, yourself. Here's one way to do it. Um, there's a kind of a theorem, Fourier's theorem, where if you want to derive these Fourier components, what you imagine doing is you imagine multiplying left and the right hand side by one of these Fourier components, let's say sine of two pi t over t, uh, t over t, and then integrating over a whole period. What you will see on the right hand side magically is that all the terms other than the exact uh, sinusoidal function that you multiply the width will go to zero. You can kind of drive that, or I think I actually do one of the, one of the integrals I do in lecture kind of looks like that. So on the right-hand side, the only thing that remains is the coefficient that matches the sinusoidal term that you picked up. On the left-hand side is where you do the calculation, and the calculation you do on the left-hand side will tell you what the coefficient should be. And that's what this simulation is doing so that we don't have to do those integrals ourselves. Um, and so, you know, if you're into electrical engineering and signal processing, well, this could be very interesting. There are many filters that are built based on uh, doing the Fourier transformation and then doing processing on the Fourier transform and then transforming back. It's a lot of fun. Now, one could easily look at and um, say, what, what's that got to do with the quantum mechanics? <laughs> and, I think uh, the tab where it's easiest to show that is under discrete to continuous. This is one where we can show what that's got to do with the quantum mechanics. Um, let me see here. Yeah, so I think this is where we are looking at the um, width of wave packet. So, um, so um, yeah. <laughs> Let's see, what can I talk about uh, Fourier transform? Uh, let me start out with a place where you might recognize it better. Um, let's see, I think, um, yeah, okay. So, I hope but this is something that you recognize. Uh, what I'm showing here is just sinusoidal wave. And um, why does it have these things? Okay. Um, so uh, let's uh, just to make sure that we understand all the graphs. Um, so, these two bottom graphs, they are both graphed on a similar scale. The x axis here, they represent, well, x value. They represent the position. This top graph here, it's graphed differently. Uh, it's, uh, graphing, uh, it's graphing not the x position, but it's graphing these coefficients. If you go back to here and think about these coefficients, uh, what this uh, uh, top graph is, graphing are the values of this a and uh, coefficients. So when you have a pure sinusoidal wave, then you have just a single coefficient here. And what it's also showing is that with that pure sinusoidal wave, it has infinite extent. Um, it, it has to, there's no other way to do it. Um, so, in quantum mechanics, we talk about how a particle is better represented with a wave packet, a localized wave. So, so you think about how you can form a wave like that. And one way to actually do it is to take a wave that looks like this and just to multiply it with uh, something that looks like, I don't know, Gaussian 
function or something that would localize this wave within that. Then once you have done that, then what you have is not up. So, you know, if you imagine doing this, if you imagine taking that, um, taking this and multiplying it with a Gaussian function e to the uh, minus X squared over two Sigma squared, that's a form of Gaussian. Uh, sigma, it, it gives you the standard distribution, sorry, standard deviation. It gives you the width of the distribution. Now, once you have done this, then uh, you don't have uh, just a pure sinusoidal wave. You have something that's more comparable to what I had on this left-hand side. Now, once you have that, then you can actually go through the calculation that I was describing just now. You can imagine taking the left-hand side, multiplying it by one of these terms, and then integrating over a period to get the coefficients a n and b n. And in the simulation, that's what they have done. They gave you um, a knob where you can change the width of your wave packet. So this sigma x knob is the one that will allow you to localize your particle with a, to a smaller range of um, position values. So, okay, let me drag this knob and do that. And, oh, so somewhere here. So as I do that, you see that these two knobs are actually connected with each other. So you might have noticed that when I moved this knob earlier, when I try to make sure that I have only a single component of sinusoidal wave, that this is sigma x went all the way to the other side. And as I try to localize the particle, as I try to make the position within a you know, limited space, this knob actually starts moving back. So, um, so what it's showing here is that in order to represent this modulating wave form like this, you need um, you need you need a multiple components. Uh, in fact, if you um, kind of study uh, AM radio, is uh, this is the the main carrier band main carrier, and these are the side bands, and this is what people use to actually transmit information through radio signals. And um, so as I try to localize this wave packet, you see that I have to introduce more and more of the other components that was not my initial frequency. And as I localize it more and more, so Ah, here's a little, a bit more side band that's beginning to show. So there's more, and as I localize it more and more. So in order to represent a wave packet that is highly localized within some region like this, it involves many different components of sinusoidal function. And what this graph is, it's showing all those components individually. So at some point it looks super busy. This is showing the sum of all of them so that you can kind of tell what the actual wave will look like. So, so in the other simulation, you saw the representation of a, a localized wave, a wave packet. And the wave packet necessarily needs to include the wavelengths or here it's actually plotting the wave number, um, two pi over lambda wavelength. Um, it needs necessarily needs to involve multiple wavelengths or wave numbers. So this is where you get a natural connection between the position uncertainty and the wavelength or through De Broglie relationship, momentum uncertainty. So, um, so I think it, that's probably as far as we'll get into Fourier analysis in this class, which is, you know, mostly at the conceptual level. I won't make you do the, the Fourier theorem calculation because um, it's typically not covered. Uh, you can do it. Uh, I do highly encourage you to try it out. Try it out with a square wave, I mean, triangular wave. And, but, um, but I won't make you do that as a part of uh, any assignment. Um, so yeah, that's what this simulation is illustrating. It, um, the connection between the space localization of a wave and uh, spreading out of the wave in the wave number or momentum space. 
um, that it, uh, there's a quite natural connection between the two. And note how other than the invocation of De Broglie relationship, I'm not actually using any quantum mechanical ideas here. All these here, it's just purely mathematical. I haven't introduced any quantum mechanical assumption other than somehow trying to tie this to momentum. That's the only place where you bring in quantum mechanics. Or well, if you are dealing with just classical waves, everything I said would apply when you try to make your classical wave localized, then necessarily involves a spreading of the frequency or wavelength of the classical wave. So 